All right, this week we are uh, looking at the magnetic exploration method. It's along with gravity. It's uh, uh, one of the two uh, so-called uh, potential field exploration methods. And um, uh, really, uh, um, with electrical, uh, finishes off the four major um, different data measurement techniques uh, uh, you know, data fields that we, uh, uh, physical fields that we try to measure in, uh, in this class. Seismic and uh, gravity, magnetic, and electromagnetic. Now, um, what are we going to expect to find when we uh, measure uh, the magnetic field? Um, we'll, uh, uh, to give you a hint, uh, here's a global map of the uh, vertical component of the Earth's magnetic field. Um, I don't know the date that this was taken on. And you can see that the measurements are all very close to, um, um, uh, if, you, uh, if you can see the, uh, the scale down here, uh, they're within a range of uh, minus 200 to 200 nanoteslas. Now that's not the um, uh, that's not the total um, value of the field. That's the uh, range is the, of variations from the average field, uh, which I think is about uh, forty thousand nanoteslas. Um, that uh, and that, that range is uh, uh, you know maybe uh, forty thousand you know thirty nine thousand and uh, uh, and 800 to uh, uh, 40,000 and and uh, um, and 200, right? Um, there's probably uh, some other regional variation that's uh, uh, that's also uh, taken into account there. Uh, you'll notice that uh, a lot of places are uh, black spots or pink spots. You know, the field does uh, diverge by more. Uh, in those uh, in those areas. So, um, what do we see uh, globally? And I think it's pretty obvious that on a global map, we're seeing the uh, uh, the oceanic uh, tectonic plates. And in fact, these green lines that you probably can't see uh, are indicating the location of the tectonic plates. The black lines are the outlines of the continents. One thing uh, that you might notice is that um, generally there's uh, a lower magnetic intensity at the equator. You know, it's more near zero, and near the uh, uh, the South Pole and near the North Pole, there are higher intensities. And if you look more closely, you'll see you know the Indian uh, craton, uh, the Australian craton, uh, the African craton, uh, the North American craton, the Fennoscandian craton. Um, these cratons are associated with the uh, the highest values and the highest variations as well of the Earth's magnetic field. You can see the so-called magnetic stripes quite easily, right? Um, that are uh, showing the the motion. You know, they're uh, sort of age contour lines that are perpendicular to the uh, the plate motions in the ocean. Uh, but um, Another thing that's quite obvious here is that the simple story of uh, magnetic reversals and uh, uh, you know the sort of tape recorder of the uh, the magnetic stripes on the seafloor uh, is uh, doesn't really apply on land um, and on the continents. Um, the magnetic field is uh, much more complicated and uh, records a much longer history. Here's a um, uh, Magnetic data centered on the North American continent. You can see uh, Quebec and Florida, Cuba down here, uh, Baja California, and uh, British Columbia. All right, even some areas on land you know that aren't uh, covered with magnetic data yet. You know, I think this is direct, uh, uh, probably total field data. You can see uh, uh, the magnetic stripes in the uh, floor of the uh, of the North Atlantic and the Arctic oceans. Okay. Uh, you can see uh, the magnetic stripes associated with the the Juan de Fuca plate, uh, you know, offshore of um, 
Oregon and Washington, British Columbia, right? So that's uh, that's pretty clear. You can see a, a big uh, positive and negative magnetic anomaly that's associated. You know, goes from pink to blue, right? That's the full range of this scale here. Um, associated, associated with the Sierra Nevada, associated with the peninsular ranges of Southern California, and then the the peninsular ranges of Baja California. All right. So where we've had uh, subduction, okay, we um, we see that uh, there's a big magnetic anomaly associated with Alaskan subduction, and all the way out the Aleutians here on the upper left, um, and. Uh, so, so uh, we can also see that the passive margin of uh, Texas, Louisiana, Florida, uh, passive margin of the eastern seaboard, is um, you know much uh, much smaller, much uh, broader, uh, broader scale magnetic anomalies. Okay, and then uh, some sort of patterns in and around the the craton. Okay, you can see the Appalachians here. There's a you know there's a suspect terrains there that have been uh, uh, abducted. Um, and uh, maybe there's also a subduction magnetic signal there as well. Uh, coming in a little bit closer, uh, you can hear, here's uh, Nevada, and you can see a, a, a magnetic uh, high which is associated with the um, uh, the Idaho um, uh, Yellowstone hotspot track in in Idaho. There's uh, Yellowstone right there. You can see that the cratonic area of the Colorado Plateau comes out uh, pretty strongly, uh, but you can see that the basin and range area, you know, here in uh, Arizona, here in the Mojave, here in Nevada, okay, and then uh, even some uh, across uh, on the north side of the uh, Yellowstone hotspot track, okay, um, is uh, is rather muted. Um, there's a big uh, magnetic anomaly near Las Vegas in the uh, Spring Mountains, and uh, you can see a little bit of that. Um, and you can see uh, uh, you can see also that the magnetic anomalies uh, are really associated in in California. The biggest ones are associated with the western slope of the Sierras. Okay, so uh, now uh, uh, going back to um, uh, this uh, close-up of North America. Uh, some of the bigger things that you can see in in uh, the North American craton are these sort of arcuate or linear features, and these have been shown to be uh, failed rifts, which are filled with uh, uh, basalts. Uh, you know that uh, were supposed to have uh, have started coming out of the ocean when um, or, or making the ocean floor. There's uh, you know the rift begins and ocean floor begins to be created and basalts are laid down. They're highly magnetic. We'll explain why in a bit. And then we see uh, we see these uh, um, these magnetic anomalies that develop. Okay, and uh, going uh, uh, closer up on one of those uh, failed rifts. Okay, it's off the western end of Lake Superior. Cuts down through Minnesota. Eventually uh, goes all the way down to uh, Kansas and and uh, Oklahoma. All right, um, this is the uh, famous Midcontinent Rift, and when um, the SEG, the Society of Exploration Geophysicists, ass assembled the very first magnetic map of uh, the North American continent, uh, this was a rather spectacular feature that nobody had thought about before. And so we have uh, high magnetic intensities. Um, these are uh, nanotesla uh, variations, um, you know, getting very high on the order of uh, plus thirty thousand, and uh, the blue areas are, are getting quite low, you know, minus uh, ten thousand. All right, so uh, a lot of variation, a lot of uh, a lot of lava, okay, a lot of uh, oceanic uh, uh, crust uh, that is now buried under, uh, you know, deep below. Deep in the crust, in these uh, failed rifts, uh, coming in much closer, you can see the the kind of detail uh, that uh, magnetic data can uh, can give you. Um, you know, few uh, techniques are as efficient uh, in for collection as uh, data collection as magnetic data. And why is that? Well, uh, for a long time, we've been able to reliably collect magnetic intensity data. Uh, even magnetic uh, directional data from the air. Okay, so um, 
that's really uh, uh, what enables uh, uh, you know collection of maps like this. Now I want you to notice uh, uh, some asymmetries in this map. You might notice that when you see a magnetic high, okay, generally there's a, so the high is in warm colors, and then around the north side of that high there'll be a moat in cool colors. Okay, there's an example up here on the upper left as well. Okay, or up here at the top, right? You got a high, and then there's kind of a broad low to the north of it. All right, here's the rift itself. Okay, it's very high, and a red, and there's a big broad low that's to the north of it. All right, and not to the south. So there's a name symmetry that uh, comes in there, and uh, we're going to talk about why that why that happens. Here's a close up of uh, these anomalies. Uh, you can see the overprinting of lots of different uh, tectonic events in the uh, the geologic history of, of northern Minnesota eons ago. Okay, you can see uh, big magnetic highs from uh, intrusion of uh, batholiths and uh, uh, volcanics. Uh, you can see the the asymmetry. You know, a magnetic high has a has a, a moat, uh, a low on the north side of it, but not on the south side. Okay, we're up here in the northern hemisphere, of course. You know, a high and the moat on the north side only. All right. Uh, you can see uh, linear features, uh, you know, that must uh, have more to do with uh, the uh, 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 the buildup of terminal moraines as the uh, the last glaciers retreated, right? They cut across all these other uh, things. They're not faults. Um, it's uh, you know magnetic minerals left in uh, in glacial tills. Uh, and uh, coming in uh, much closer, we can see the uh, the asymmetry, the moat on the uh, on the north side of uh, big highs, okay, and uh, we start to see the granularity of this uh, fantastically detailed magnetic data. You know, in some places where there's uh, you know we got to identify certain blocks that have edges, you know, but um, you know there's almost no detail on their interior. All right. So uh, very uh, very interesting way of uh, you know kind of classifying different terrains here. You can identify terrains and their bounding faults in, in magnetic data, and uh, some of that you can see also in these uh, magnetic maps of Australia, magnetic anomaly maps. Um, so here we have Western Australia, and then Eastern Australia is partly obscured. Um, Tasmania is way down here. You can see some uh, great big highs where there are volcanic areas in Queensland, uh, and then a very complex uh, picture here in uh, in Western Australia. These are uh, you know world class mining districts here, uh, also a very old craton, so extremely complicated history, and uh, you can see uh, uh, you know failed rifts uh, perhaps, and uh, you know old uh, subduction zones. Um, you know, evidence of rifting away from the uh, the western uh, coast of uh, of Australia. Um, you know, this is all uh, uh, you know many hundreds uh, of millions, if not uh, if not billions of years ago. And then these uh, you know trends. Uh, you know, what's uh, what's causing these this sort of square setup of of linear uh, linear trends. And here's uh, we're going to focus down into a, a mineral district. Okay, you can see that there's uh, patterns of of uh, highs and lows that are uh, allowing us to detect a uh, particular kind of uh, a particular geologic terrain, and uh, you know, getting uh, close into that, uh, you know, we can see these uh, I don't know kind of scratches and and rills on these uh, on these things. Uh, you know, dike sequences and uh, Evidence of uh, of tectonics that's probably uh, one or two or maybe four billion years old. Um, uh, you know, batholiths, uh, uh, basins, uh, all those are 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 here on the map. Here's uh, from southeastern Australia now instead of southwestern Australia. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, the province of or the uh, yeah the state of Victoria, the Australian state of Victoria, has these uh, sort of Bullet uh, bullseye magnetic highs. Okay, and uh, you might be saying, well, if you got a magnetic high, why aren't we seeing a uh, 
a uh, a low moat around the uh, the north side. Ah, we're in the southern hemisphere here, and that's as well the southern magnetic hemisphere. So the uh, the 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 bull, the lows the moats are on the south side of the highs. You can see that pretty easily here, um, and uh, along uh, uh, the southern southern edges of many of these highs are uh, their low moats. And here's a particular, uh, you know, this is a, um, you know, a small place uh, prospect that's just a few kilometers wide, and you can see it's associated with a uh, uh, a very high uh, um, uh, magnetism. Okay, uh, and this one happens to be associated with gold. Okay, now I've been saying, uh, you know, we can see uh, I've been talking about certain rocks like basalts having uh, higher uh, giving us higher magnetic signals. All right, we've got to talk about magnetic properties of materials, minerals, and rocks. Okay, so uh, materials in general uh, we can classify into uh, uh, five groups of different kinds of, of magnetic behavior. One is diamagnetism, two paramagnetism, three ferromagnetism, three anti-ferromagnetism, and five. Uh, that's four, and then five ferri. Magnetism. Okay. The diamagnetism is a is actually a fundamental property of all matter, you know, uh, and it's defined as all right. You take uh, an imposed magnetic field like the internal field of the Earth, right, which has an internal magnetic field, and that's H. Okay. You multiply it by this factor. Uh, I don't know. It looks like an X to me. It's probably a chi, but uh, let's let's call it X. Okay. Or uh, maybe it's a uh, if it's chi, it could be k uh, for magnetic susceptibility, and that produces an induced magnetic field M. Okay, and um, so here's a little graph. Uh, as H increases to the right, you know what happens to the induced field? Okay, it's not the M is not the total field, but you know which is going to be mostly the the Earth's in. Uh, um, uh, applied field, right? H is the applied field, okay. And so the total is basically going to be equal to H, but there's going to be a little component uh, M, all right. And uh, uh, di with diamagnetism, uh, the this chi k x constant of proportionality, okay, is less than zero, all right. So um, basically, you apply a magnetic field to uh, to all matter, and uh, it's going to all matter will resist that magnetic field in this uh, applied magnetic field in this proportional way. Okay, so here's the actual this dotted line is actually what we're looking for. You know that's the uh, 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 the slope gives you the this constant of proportionality x or chi or k uh, that um, is uh, uh, going to give you the the induced magnetic field. All right, but um, uh, we say here that the uh, the diamagnetic uh, field, the induced diamagnetic field, is very weak. So x is very small, right? Now, now, you know, h is uh, magnetic uh, field strength, and m is another magnetic field strength, right? They have the same units, so chi has to be a uh, k. The magnetic um, susceptibility, okay, has to be a unitless constant of proportionality. All right, it's the slope of this line, and since H and M have the same units, it has to be uh, unitless. All right, and it's negative. Okay, so it's going to resist the applied magnetic field, but just a tiny bit. Okay, paramagnetism. All right, so um, there are unpaired electrons in partially filled filled orbitals, and uh, so they have a net magnetic moment, and. Uh, uh, you know, again, the uh, you take the applied field, you multiply it by a constant of proportionality, uh, which is the uh, uh, magnetic susceptibility k or or chi, and in this case for paramagnetism, chi is greater than zero, and so uh, uh, the uh, the induced m is going to add to the total field instead of subtracting from it. Okay, ferromagnetism very important. All right. Even though, um, um, okay, so uh, 
basically the uh, the magnetic moments of uh, every single atom, every single crystal in a ferromagnet are uh, uh, they're all perfectly aligned. They're all perfectly in the same direction. Okay, and that of course gives an extremely powerful uh, magnet. Now, um, these uh, uh, um, these alignments. Uh, are are very strong and they're very very well preserved, you know, in, in ferromagnets, okay. But eventually, uh, you know, thermal energy can get over the electronic exchange forces that are maintaining these uh, these perfectly aligned moments, and there's a randomizing effect. Some of the moments will reverse direction or they'll turn a little bit, and and the higher the temperature, you know, the more there there's going to be mismatches and non-parallel alignments. And finally, you reach what's called the Curie temperature of a particular material, and it goes random, and the induced ferromagnetism goes to zero. Now, um, uh, ferromagnetism is is uh, pretty rare in geological materials, you know, lodestones and such, uh, which are pretty rare artifacts, uh, usually magnetized by incredible currents uh, uh, that have uh, flowed through a uh, uh, a, uh, a ferrous rock when uh, when lightning strikes it. Okay, so uh, you know the huge current is associated with a uh, a huge magnetic field, and uh, you know in, in a lightning strike, and that uh, that can create uh, ferromagnetism. Uh, most magnetic minerals that we are, are going to look at are ferromagnetic. Okay, ferromagnetic, and they do have a lot of aligned uh, magnetic moments. You know. Most of the uh, crystals, atoms, and so forth in in the uh, ferromagnetic materials are are not aligned. Uh, many of them are aligned, and then some are not aligned, and they're aligned in the opposite direction. Okay, so you know you kind of get three out of three; they're going in the same direction. So you know that gives a, a, a somewhat weaker, um, uh, somewhat weaker uh, uh, total uh, uh, magnetic. Um, Susceptibility, but uh, you know it can in certain cases be almost as strong as ferromagnets. So uh, uh, again, alignment of atomic moments. Okay, and this is the one that's uh, really the primary source of uh, magnetism in geologic materials. Now we're talking about domains. You know, I, this could be a picture of domains here on the right. You know, some of them aligned, uh, most of them not, um, and a few of them uh, aligned backwards. Okay, so uh, you can have uh, domains that uh, you know one uh, rock particle, uh, one crystal might have a single domain. It'll make a very strong magnet, uh, but if it starts to get divided up into multiple domains and they uh, they switch, right? This uh, this one here, uh, uh, you know, where you just have two domains and they're uh, they're opposite each other perfectly. I mean, you come uh, away, you know, a little bit away from that mineral crystal, and you're not going to see any uh, any net magnetic uh, effect. Okay, uh, no no net uh, um, uh, uh, magnetic uh, um, susceptibility. Okay, and uh, you know, you get multiple domains, and uh, you know, two of them can be aligned, and one might not. All right. Now, the uh, because we have this idea of domains, grain size actually matters. And and I've seen a site that was studied. Uh, it's a sedimentary site, and the, it had classic dikes. And those dikes could be studied uh, by their uh, uh, their magnetic susceptibility. Okay, so um, there's kind of an interplay between uh, uh, the diameter of the particles, you know, the grain size of the of the mag magnetic particles, and you know, here for um, Magnetite, uh, uh, you know, the diameter is small, and and for hematite, it's uh, it's somewhat uh, larger. Okay, these are micrometers, right? Uh, those are the kind of the interaction of domain size with um, um, with the overall magnetic behavior, because the the grains, the sediment grains, the magnetite grains in the sediment, as they're uh, floating down, they can become aligned all by themselves. And if they come out of alignment, that means that something may have happened. And there's a, uh, a particular you know diameter like uh, you know 0.08 uh, micrometer that allows you to see that best, right? That forms the best and most, the strongest and most stable uh, magnetic intensity. Here it's called uh, 
coercivity. Okay, that's uh, you know an experimental measure of uh, magnetic intensity uh, in the lab. Uh, one thing that uh, we have to keep track of is this concept of hysteresis. All right, I just want to mention it. Uh, it's not going to affect our our work in this class, but uh, as the uh, the induced magnetic field fluctuates up and down, the um, the magnetization uh, doesn't respond um, uh, doesn't respond uh, linearly. You know, it doesn't just go up and down a uh, a linear scale passing through zero. Basically, if you start it off and you magnetize a material, you induce a magnetic field. It'll come up not not linearly, but I mean, so, you know, over short ranges, kind of linearly, but on the smooth curve, right? And uh, then if you start reducing the uh, the field, then it will, um, you know, it's kind of uh, the the magnetization is 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 not going to recover as fast. It's not going to fall as fast as you're as you're as you're taking the uh, in the uh, applied magnetic field down. So you know you might take the magnetic field down to zero, and the remnant magnetism m sub r is going to be um, uh, is is going to be uh, non-zero. You know, it could be half of what the maximum was, and uh, then you um, you take that uh, you know you 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 take the uh, magnetic field you know down negative the opposite direction, and finally the uh, um, the uh, the magnetization. You know, will hit uh, zero. That's called the uh, coercivity, the magnetic coercivity, that H sub C. Okay. You take now. You you're starting to force it towards a, a negative, right? And uh, uh, and it reaches it, and then you uh, you 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 decrease that field, and it's going to go uh, again. You know, it doesn't respond very quickly, and so you end up going in this hysteresis loop. Okay. And uh, you can go around in that loop. Uh, you know the coercivity, the remnant magnetism. You know those are all um, uh, something that uh, uh, the rock can retain over millions of years, even billions of years. So um, even though, um, okay, now uh, the um, uh, the other thing that happens in magnetic minerals uh, is temperature dependent, and uh, so here's a, uh, a temperature scale, okay, and this would be for a ferromagnetic or ferromagnetic uh, material, okay, and you've got a, a a relative magnetization, okay. The original magnetization is uh, you know one hundred percent up here, and that's at a temperature of twenty degrees C, okay. As you start raising the temperature. Right now, you've got you know as many aligned domains as you're going to have, okay, and um, <clears throat> and so the um, uh, as as you start raising the temperature, right, the domains are going to split and and uh, and some of them are going to be not aligned, and as you, the higher and higher the temperature, and the uh, the more domains you get, and the more different directions, and finally. You can see it, it sort of catastrophically drops to uh, zero magnetization. Okay, uh, I don't know what what mineral this is for, but um, uh, for this mineral, uh, it happens. The Curie temperature is uh, T sub C is five hundred seventy five degrees C. Okay, so uh, you know the, that's how the 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 magnetic ro uh, minerals record the magnetic field, right? Um, it's through this mechanism of the Curie temperature. When the when the lava is erupted, okay, it's at a temperature of 800 or 1100 degrees C. Okay, basaltic lava at 1100 degrees C. Uh, it's way up above the Curie temperature. You know, it's 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 going to have zero magnetization. It cools, crystallizes. Uh, you know, at about uh, uh, by 800 C, it's it's fully crystallized. Okay, uh, still above the Curie temperature. It's not going to have any uh, uh, net uh, magnetization, net magnetic field. As it passes through the Curie temperature, finally those domains are going to start organizing, okay, and it will have a magnetization. So you know by 500 uh, degrees C, you know 75 degrees C below the Curie temperature, it's got half of the uh, magnetization it's going to get, and uh, you know then you take it down to 20 degrees C, 
and it's got um, you know as much magnetization as uh, uh, as as it'll have at least on the on the surface of the Earth. Okay, so um, uh, you know, and 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 remember, uh, you know, if you didn't take three thirty three, you might not have heard this. Um, you know, how deep in the Earth do you need to go to get up to uh, you know whatever for whatever this mineral is a temperature of five hundred seventy five degrees C? Well, only halfway through the crust. You know, maybe at fifteen, uh, certainly by twenty kilometers, you're up above that temperature um, uh, in depth, uh, twenty kilometers depth. So uh, the entire interior of the Earth, except for just that you know thin, thin outer shell of twenty kilometers, right? That in the entire interior of the Earth is non-magnetic. It, it can't have any ferromagnetism. It can't have any ferromagnetism. There's no uh, there's no minerals uh, you know below the crust that are going to have any permanent magnetism. And and I just said that the uh, uh, the Earth has a uh, magnetic field, and we'll talk more about that later. How is that possible? Uh, well, that means that uh, since uh, most of the Earth is above the Curie temperature, we've only got two choices, right? The uh, uh, and and those of you in three thirty three heard this, right? Either the whole magnetic field is is produced by this thin, thin, thin outer shell of the Earth, which is kind of ridiculous. It would have to be made of solid magnetite to to do that. So that's not a possibility. The only the only other thing left. Is that there are actual electrical currents uh, in inside the Earth, and that's that's the case. Uh, you know, convecting uh, molten iron uh, with a little bit of oxygen, probably uh, inside the uh, the outer core of the Earth. That's um, that you know that's about uh, three thousand kilometers down. Um, uh, that's what's uh, that convection. That molten iron is what is. Uh, uh, causing uh, the the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so uh, let's talk about uh, uh, magnetic susceptibility a little bit more. So again, I, I said it's a uh, you know here the symbol is chi, uh, and then in the literature you'll see kappa or k. Uh, I would just rather talk about it as a k. That's much simpler uh, to me. And so uh, you get the magnetization of the material. The induced magnetic field, and then um, uh, that's uh, K times the uh, applied magnetic field H. Okay, so it's a a uh, uh, K is a uh, unitless uh, constant of, of proportionality. All right, so let's look at some uh, magnetic susceptibilities. Uh, here's uh, some materials or non-materials. You know, vacuum is is not a material, but uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's a uh, something you can you can make in the lab, right? And um, its magnetic susceptibility, you know, its K is zero. All right, water, it's diamagnetic, and I said diamagnetism was weak. It's minus the you know all these diamagnetic uh, materials are uh, um, are weak and negative. Okay, so they they resist the applied field, the Earth's field. You know, water uh, minus one point two times ten to the minus five. Okay, uh, five orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the uh, the mag magnetization is five orders of magnitude smaller than the applied field. Uh, bismuth metal, uh, pure carbon. Okay, <coughs> um, I don't know if this is diamond or or uh, um, or uh, 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 you know graphite, uh, that sort of thing. Carbon black probably um, minus two point one. Okay, very small. Turns out that oxygen uh, O the O two molecule has a little bit of positive magnetization. Okay, uh, mag magnetic susceptibility. Aluminum metal, tiny tiny bit of uh, positive magnetic susceptibility. Okay, iron. Right. Uh, a factor of two hundred, you know. So it's it's not um, it's it's going to amplify the applied magnetic field by a factor of two hundred. Okay, iron is ferromagnetic. So is cobalt. So is nickel. So this ferromagnet magnetism is seven orders of magnitude above the ten of the minus five of the dia of the uh, diamagnetic materials. Ah, but the ferromagnetic materials. 
they all have a Curie temperature. You know, Nichols is pretty low, um, seven three seventy two C. Uh, irons is seven seventy four C. Okay, here's some here's some minerals now. Those were uh, materials. Okay, and um, this is a uh, uh, kind of a, a magnetic uh, uh, susceptibility on a different uh, different scale. Okay, uh, so magnetite is ferromagnetic. Okay, we're going to talk about magnetite a lot when we talk about uh, magnetic uh, uh, susceptibilities. All right, it's got a Curie temperature of uh, five seventy five to five eighty five. Okay. Pretty high Curie temperature, and uh, relative to these other ones, it's got a quite a high, um, quite a high uh, um, uh, magnetic susceptibility. Okay, uh, Ulvo spinel. Okay, it is anti ferromagnetic, and so it has a uh, there's there's uh, the Curie temperature is not on here. I, I'm not sure why, but it's not on here, and so this is the susceptibility minus 153. Okay, hematite. It's a it's a canted uh, uh, anti ferromagnetism, and so it comes out positive, and it's it's higher actually than uh, magnetites. I'm sorry, it has a higher uh, uh, Curie temperature, six seventy five degrees C, uh, but it's um, you know it's, it's not nearly as organized as magnetite, and has uh, you know um, it's like one two hundredth of uh, as magnetic as uh, as magnetite, but that's still pretty good. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, ilmenite, another uh, anti-ferro uh, uh, magnetic uh, material, uh, with a very strong, uh, you know, minus two thirty-three uh, anti uh, uh, anti uh, uh, magnetism, and uh, then we have some ferromagnetic uh, materials like magnetite, maghemite, Jacobsite, Treverite. Uh, magnesioferrite, okay, you know they have uh, up to uh, uh, Curie temperatures that, that range widely, you know, from a low of 300 to uh, uh, up to 600 degrees C, and uh, not not a huge range of uh, magnetic susceptibilities, you know, uh, all about uh, uh, you know half or, or uh, two thirds of uh, magnetites. So. Uh, you know, really, what what you have is uh, um, you have uh, uh, rocks. Uh, you know, salt and slate are mostly dia diamagnetic. Okay, uh, they might have tiny proportions of uh, you know hematite or or uh, uh, magnetite. Okay, and so basically, you know, it looks like salt, slate, limestone, granulite, rhyolite, uh, greenstone. Uh, all of those, okay, uh, you know, have very little in the in the way of ferromagnetic minerals like uh, magnetite, and uh, so they essentially have you know zero to maybe you know here five percent magnetic susceptibility, right? That's the highest for granulite. Um, uh, now you get to, into the more uh, you know ferrous rocks, right? Basalt, gabbro, dolerite, okay. And you know they might not have much uh, magnetite in them, and magnetite weathers, weathers rather quickly. So, you know, if you weather a basalt, you're going to take its magnetic susceptibility down right away, and it'll have a. Uh, but but you know if it's an in place uh, basalt or gabbro, you know it's got 0.1 one tenth, right, magnetic susceptibility, and so that uh, if that's for the whole rock, and that's that's significant, we can measure that very easily. Okay, so. Uh, these uh, basic, these uh, ferrous, uh, uh, you know, ferro, 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 uh, uh, magnesio uh, rocks. Uh, uh, they they can be quite uh, magnetic. Okay, here's some some minerals. You know, pyrite, hematite. They're all quite quite low. Pyrotite. Uh, look at that. Okay, so um, you know these are very. Uh, uh, you know, very important minerals for uh, uh, you know gold and and uh, and and copper and other uh, you know other uh, uh, metal uh, uh, ores. Okay, and uh, you know so so uh, pyrite and hematite uh, you get nothing, but if you have some pyrotite in there, <coughs> right? Uh, 
right? You get a magnetic susceptibility of, of one, okay? Um, and chromite, you know, 1.5. If and the magnetite itself, okay, depending on uh, you know how organized it is, it can have a magnetic susceptibility of a factor of 20, right? That's like the ferromagnets, right? Where the uh, uh, the induced field uh, magnetic field is going to be larger than the uh, um, uh, than the applied field, okay? Right. Once this gets over one. So here's some uh, median values and ranges of uh, magnetic susceptibilities. The very bottom of the scale is, is uh, 10 to the minus 5, which is essentially 0 as far as we're concerned. 1 is at the top, right? And uh, here's uh, you know, 1 tenth, 10 to the minus 1. Draw a line across there. Granite really never reaches uh, uh, 1 tenth. Gabbro is uh, usually 1 tenth. Basalt, basalt is usually above 1 tenth. Okay, so uh, you know these uh, volcanic and uh, 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 these rocks that have magnetite. Okay, they are are very usually very much above um, the uh, uh, the magnetism. You know, like two orders of magnitude at least uh, in magnetism above uh, sedimentary rocks uh, like shale, sandstone, limestone, dolomite. Right, those all have uh, median values that are. Below ten to the minus three, whereas uh, you know uh, these volcanic rocks on the right, in red, they have uh, magnetic susceptibilities that are uh, they can easily be uh, one tenth or higher, right? So two orders of magnitude difference. So really, uh, you know, we're magnetic exploration is kind of looking for and sensing the presence of uh, these volcanic rocks, gabbro, and especially basalt. Very, uh, very magnetic. Um, now you'll see sandstone and shale, right? I, I have seen a sandstone on a beach in the North Island, Island of New Zealand that was basically solid magnetite. And yes, there's a big iron mine there, and uh, there used to be a, uh, a huge uh, uh, steel mill. Okay, um, and then you know it's cheaper for them to uh, import their uh, steel from Brazil now, I think. So. Um, you know that's why sandstone, uh, you know, has this huge range. It, you know, because uh, yeah, a lot of sands, uh, beach sands, river sands, can have a lot of magnetite in them. Okay, but never quite as uh, well. Not never uh, like that that beach, uh, that uh, magnetite uh, beach. But uh, uh, you know, they rarely have uh, as much magnetite in them as as your average granite, gabbro, or basalt. Okay. Just a note about remnant uh, magnetism, right? You get a total magnetism, which is the uh, the chi, the k, uh, the the magnetic susceptibility times the applied field h, and then you got to add the remnant magnetism. Okay. All right. Now we got to talk a bit about uh, where the Earth's magnetic field comes from. Okay. So uh, at the top here is the geographic pole, right? So that would be the North Pole as you know it. Uh, with the North Star right over it, okay, and uh, here's the South uh, Geographic Pole, and uh, here is a, a little bar magnet uh, that has this uh, this uh, dipole field, okay, coming out of the South Pole, and and then the magnetic lines of force are uh, are diving into the Earth at the North Geomagnetic Pole, okay. So uh, notice that the uh, the geomagnetic pole is canted, you know, several degrees away from the geographic pole. The two poles, the magnetic pole and the geographic pole, are not at the same place. Okay, and um, that also means that the geographic equator is not at the same place as the geomagnetic equator. Okay, so um, uh, that's an interesting, a very interesting curiosity. Um, you know, says a lot about what's going on inside the Earth, um, and uh, you you might know from uh, Geology 100 that uh, you know these uh, the Earth's magnetic field can uh, flip over from time to time. The Earth's uh, uh, and that means the geomagnetic poles must flip, uh, or maybe the maybe the the uh, the dipole field ceases to exist for a short time. Okay. 
And the uh, uh, if you remember the movie The Core, uh, they had some rather spectacular special effects, uh, you know, destroying the, the Golden Gate Bridge with these, uh, you know, microwave uh, uh, intensity uh, um, um, solar uh, radiation beams that uh, you know break through the uh, 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 break through the magnetic field uh, once it uh, decreases enough. Um, you know, that was Hollywood. So um, the uh, the geographic pole, right? The uh, uh, that's the Earth's axis of rotation, right? That doesn't change. You know, it uh, it wobbles a little bit, uh, especially when you have giant earthquakes like the uh, the Sumatran uh, earthquake of uh, 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 a few years ago. Uh, but um, uh, basically, it uh, it 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 only moves by a few meters. Uh, you know, if you're standing in on the ground in, in at the South Pole of Antarctica. Uh, they've tracked, you know, how far the uh, the geographic pole has moved, and it's just a few meters. The geomagnetic uh, pole, on the other hand, is a wanderer. Uh, it's uh, moving uh, uh, pretty fast. Uh, I'm not sure it's as fast as you can walk, but it's uh, it's changing by uh, uh, you know every year by uh, tens, if not hundreds, of kilometers. So uh, that adds uh, uh, some time dependence to our uh, the location of the uh, magnetic pole, and um, uh, you know the other things like the geomagnetic equator. You know those those things change location with time. So uh, you know here's a, another drawing of a bar magnet with the uh, the south pole and the north pole. Okay, and uh, um, depending on where you are on the Earth, you know if you're at the uh, if you're at the equator, right? The magnetic lines of force are horizontal. If you're at the geomagnetic equator, if you're at the uh, the geomagnetic pole, the magnetic lines of force are vertical. Okay, and if you're in between, like uh, in Nevada, you know we're at 40 north, um, the magnetic lines of force are, are diving into the ground, you know, towards magnetic north. And uh, uh, if you're uh, you know in uh, in the southern hemisphere, like in Australia. The magnetic lines of force are launching out of the ground at an angle, uh, you know, coming from the uh, uh, they're they're diving they're they're launching away from the uh, south uh, uh, geomagnetic pole. Okay, so that's a uh, dipole applied to the Earth. Now um, I, I urge you to uh, uh, everyone to print out this sheet. It's in the uh, the PDF notes. You don't have to get it out of the uh, uh, the magnetic uh, uh, PDF. Okay, so you get a, a high, a full resolution version uh, by printing that sheet uh, out of the uh, magnetic uh, overheads. Okay, uh, and uh, this legend at the bottom right—that is the critical thing. Okay, because uh, uh, depending on where you are on the Earth, you know, are you at the magnetic pole? Are you um, not at the pole and not at the magnetic equator? Okay. And then it makes a difference. Which way is your traverse, right? All these traverses here; these are the magnetic signals. All these traverses are um, <clears throat> all these traverses are uh, um, uh, you know in a certain direction, right? And so uh, you know the uh, uh, for the first one, you know the. Uh, that's as if you were at the uh, uh, the north magnetic pole, and so the magnetic lines of force are straight down. Okay, and you can see you get a uh, over a sphere, you get a high and equal gutters on each side. Okay, and um, so uh, that's at the north magnetic pole. If you're uh, at the uh, at the south magnetic pole, then you'd see a you know the negative of this uh, of this anomaly here. Uh, but it would still be symmetrical. Okay. Now, um, when you're at the geomagnetic equator, that's the lower two. Okay. And at, when you're at the equator, uh, and you can see in the legend, the uh, uh, if you print it out, uh, you can't see it in the video, I'm sure. <coughs> the magnetic lines of force are horizontal. If you're at the geomagnetic equator, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, you know this this still has an anomaly. But then it matters, uh, you know. Are you, are is your traverse lined up with the uh, with the magnetic lines of force, which are which are horizontal, 
If that's the case, then that would be the fourth one here. And uh, uh, at the bottom, right, that's where uh, your traverse is east-west, and the magnetic lines of force are horizontal and, uh, 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 and, and going across your array. And notice how, how uh, there's a flat line here, a straight line. You know, that's situation number five, OK? And that's when you're at the magnetic equator. And you're doing an east-west traverse, right? There's a lot of <coughs> a lot of these anomalies that uh, that do not uh, a lot of these anomalous uh, bodies. You know, these these could have as strong as a of a magnetic susceptibility as you want. And an anticline, a sill, a dipping dike, okay, gradually sloping surface, a wide dike, a vertical sheet. Uh, you know, uh, this vertical sheet would be north striking. Uh, and you're doing a traverse east-west over it, uh, and uh, and if you're at the magnetic equator, you don't see anything. Okay, it's a flat line. You get no signal. So the magnetic equator is uh, kind of a lousy place to do uh, uh, magnetics. So uh, you can run into the magnetic equator in Africa and uh, South America, like in Brazil. You're very close to the magnetic equator, uh, and it's a tough place to do magnetics. Uh, you know, basically at the magnetic equator, you don't, you're not going to do any east-west traverses. You're going to do all north-south traverses, and and that's the only way. You know, that'll be this class four here, and that way you'll see something. Okay. Now you know that magnetic fields are created by a moving electric charge. Uh, that's our only option in the uh, you know below the depth at which uh, all rocks reach the Curie temperatures of the most common magnetic minerals. So. You know when you're certainly below the crust, right? And the temperature, the temperature at the moho at the bottom of the crust is supposed to be uh, about 1,100 degrees C, right? Up at that temperature, you know, the, that's you're up above the Curie temperature of every magnetic mineral. So the only way to generate a magnetic field is not with uh, permanent magnetism, not with ferromagnetism or anything like that, not with magnetite. Uh, the only way to generate a, a magnetic field is with a moving electric charge. Okay, now there are um, uh, now those moving electric charges in the outer core of the Earth. Okay, are going to give you a uh, 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 this. Uh, they create uh, externally to the Earth. They create this uh, apparently dipole field. Mostly, it's not a perfect dipole. Okay, and you're going to get uh, you know different uh, 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 different directions of. Um, uh, different directions of uh, 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 magnetic components. Okay, and um, we have a uh, SI unit uh, which is called the uh, it's just the uh, flux density, magnetic flux density, and that's called the uh, uh, the Tesla. Okay, now the uh, the the incredibly powerful magnets in um, uh, in MRI machines, uh, magnetic resonance imagers. Uh, those have magnets that are capable of uh, one or two tesla. Okay, I think some uh, someone uh, uh, you know had a huge bank of capacitors and a coil of incredibly thick uh, copper wire, and uh, uh, used that to, you know and they they uh, use that huge huge bank of capacitors to produce a giant current and produce a giant magnetic field, uh, and uh, they may have achieved a field of. Uh, of uh, seven Tesla, uh, but of course that caused the apparatus to to blow apart, okay? Because the 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 field the str the field uh, the forces due to the magnetic field were just too strong, okay? So uh, uh, you know our um, uh, our our uh, magnetic fields that we're going to measure are much much weaker. You know they're on the order of tens of micro Tesla. Okay, um, but uh, we talk about a total uh, field strength in nano Tesla. That's ten to the minus nine Tesla. Okay, um, so it's a uh, it's a billionth of a of a Tesla. Okay, and I mean that's how that's how kind of off uh, off kilter the the Tesla SI unit is, right? We're going to measure magnetic fields in tens of thousands of nano Tesla. You know, here in Nevada, it's about uh, Forty thousand uh, nanotesla, or I'm sorry, fifty thousand, fifty-one thousand nanotesla. Okay. 
and and so uh, um, we uh, um, uh, you know and we're going to look at magnetic anomalies. Uh, uh, if we're lucky, we might see magnetic anomalies that are on the order of a thousand nanotesla, right? That's a one micro tesla, okay. But a thousand nanotesla is a big anomaly, so you know we might be looking at at anomalies of one or two hundred nanotesla, okay, and that's uh, um, uh, that's entirely uh, entirely reasonable. Okay, so uh, uh, you know what is the um, 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 you know what are the characteristics of the uh, Earth's magnetic field that we got to keep track of? You've all heard of the magnetic declination, okay? Which is uh, you know here's Nevada over here, it's about twenty degrees. Uh, uh, maybe oh that's a, those are those are five uh, uh, five degree uh, contour lines, okay? So um, uh, you know about fifteen degrees east, okay, of uh, of of uh, true north. And then uh, uh, you can see around the magnetic equator, there's uh, about uh, zero, um, uh, zero magnetic uh, declination. And then here's the uh, total intensity. <coughs> and the intensity is highest uh, in northern Canada, which is actually where the, uh, the north magnetic pole is. OK. And, uh, uh, and so we're at about uh, fifty-two thousand uh, nanotesla at, uh, uh, at at Nevada, okay. Um, but uh, you know, up in Canada, it gets to be sixty thousand. Now on the equator, you know, it's down to in Brazil here, it's down to twenty-four thousand. Brazil, Argentina, down to twenty-four thousand, okay. So the magnetic intensity is is high near the magnetic poles, uh, and there's the south geomagnetic pole. Okay, uh, south of Australia, touching Antarctica, um, and along the magnetic equator, the uh, the the uh, magnetic total intensity gets to be uh, a minimum. <laughs> now, this uh, secular variation says, "All right, you know, the total intensity is going to change, okay, every year, by you know, it's going to get uh, to be, it's going to get." You know, eighty nanotesla less. Okay, that's the Earth's field. I mean, that's an incredibly rapid change, incredibly huge change for uh, uh, for a whole Earth property, right? I mean, we see tides. You know, gravity changes slightly by uh, by uh, forty uh, uh, microgal every day. Okay, um, you know, that's uh, uh, one part per per billion. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, you know these 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 are, these are pretty huge changes. You know it's only only one part in in ten thousand. Okay, and it's changing that much per year. So that's uh, you can think okay ten thousand years it's going to be zero, right? Maybe it will be. Uh, and and that's that all comes from this uh, you know complicated model of the geodynamo. Uh, we've got these currents that are occurring in the. Uh, um, you know there are poloidal flows and toroidal flows, uh, and uh, you know the uh, uh, locations of the uh, um, of of how the uh, the inner core is uh, wobbling. You know it changes with uh, with time, and all that produces these different flow directions. And you average all that together at any given moment, and that gives you the Earth's approximate uh, uh, dipole field. Now to keep track of this, uh, you can go to this NOAA site, uh, ngdc.noaa.gov, okay, and you can go to uh, and under there slash seg slash geomag, you can get uh, information about uh, how fat you know what the field strength is uh, you know in any given year in any given place, at least in the United States. So you set a uh, uh, a uh, uh, a start date and an, and an end date, okay. And uh, it'll tell you, uh, you know, what the uh, field is going to be. Notice, you know, here this is set for, um, uh, you know, basically Reno, right? 39, 30, 39 degrees, 30 minutes north, uh, uh, minus 119 degrees, 50 uh, minutes uh, west. Okay, elevation of 1500 meters, right? 
1907, the, the magnetic declination was 18 degrees 15 minutes east. Uh, and by 2007, it's only 14 minutes. It changed by 4 degrees, okay? Quite a bit. The inclination, right? It's point, you know, the magnetic field lines are pointing down into the ground, you know, toward this uh, this direction east of, of geographic north, okay? And um, the inclination's uh, not changing much. It's only changing by uh, you know one minute per year. The declination's changing by seven minutes per year, minutes of, of arc, okay? And uh, I just want to look at the total field here. I I, I really care most about the uh, the total field. That's what we're gonna what we're going to measure, really, okay? In 1907, uh, in in uh, Reno, we were at uh, almost 56,000 nanotesla, and now it's only 2007. 100 years later, we're at only 50,000. You know, barely, not not quite even 51,000 nanotesla. So it's you know it's dropped by 10 percent, okay? In 100 years, that's ridiculous. All right, it's changing by uh, almost 80 nanoteslas a year. All right, and that's what this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, NOAA uh, geomagnetic model, you know, and its time dependency shows. Okay, we got to keep track of it. It's still falling, right? It's already uh, 2013. Um, now I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about diurnal variation and, and magnetic storms, and uh, let's see if I can go to um, uh, the uh, uh, yeah here we go. These are summary plots uh, from Natural Natural Resources uh, Canada, and um, I'll try to zoom in a bit um, on these. Okay, uh, we've got uh, uh, stations. Uh, the most northern stations are up at the top of the of the page. Okay. And they're the ones that are most uh, susceptible to, um, uh, you know, this uh, solar activity. Okay, and as we go down the page, we're getting towards more southern stations. And the southernmost, you know, there's Ottawa, and Victoria is the the southernmost. Okay, um, so what's happening at uh, at uh, Victoria? Okay, uh, let's go over to the left hand side. And the, we have a nanotesla scale. Zero runs right through the middle, so it's a full. You know, it goes from minus fifty to fifty at Victoria, and also at Ottawa. Okay, minus fifty to fifty. And uh, you know, Victoria is not that far from here. You know, compared to Resolute on the northern, uh, you know, Canadian Arctic islands, for heaven's sake. So uh, you know, we'll 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 keep track of what's going on here, courtesy of Natural Resources Canada. Um, uh, you know, in our field area, we'll, we'll keep track by looking at the Victoria record. Okay, not that far from here. Um, all right, so we've got uh, there's this wave of magnetic change. You know, in the last uh, 12 hours, right, uh, which is um, uh, you know it's fairly flat for uh, uh, for the previous 12 hours, and then this wave of magnetic change. That's the diurnal variation. Okay, the sun. Heats the uh, magnetosphere, and we get a, a an overall change in the uh, in the total intensity of, of the magnetic field at uh, uh, at Victoria and at Reno. Okay, and you know Ottawa is quite a bit east, so it happened earlier there. Okay, so uh, let's see, universal time hours. Yeah, eighteen. That's uh, that's uh, uh, ten o'clock in the morning uh, in Victoria or here. Um, and uh, zero is uh, four o'clock in the afternoon here. Um, so the magnetic intensity was falling through the uh, afternoon. Okay, you're going to be surveying through times like that, and you, you know, you have to be aware the magnetic intensity will change. By uh, looks like the change here is almost a hundred nanotesla. Okay, that's a. I've been looking at these records a lot. That's a pretty big swing in uh, uh, in uh, magnetic intensity. Uh, and you know we have the the, th the three components here x y and z. Basically, you know I want you to look for the biggest one, and that uh, for this particular uh, uh, time it appears to be y. Okay, and so that's going to affect the total intensity as well. And that's a swing of of almost a hundred uh, nanotesla. So so 
you know that's that's kind of like a tide, right? Uh, and so we go back to a base station and uh, with our magnetometer, and we can keep track of that. You can see it's kind of smooth, but there are these variations here. Um, you know these these little jerks in the magnetic field. It's only by uh, you know less than ten nanotesla. Uh, but what does that mean? That means that if we see a magnetic anomaly that is less than uh, 10 nanotesla, we're just not going to be able to believe it, right? Because it, we could have these random jerks in the magnetic field, right? You can see these curves are not perfectly smooth, right? Um, so if if we were surveying, you know, along one line for the whole afternoon and we saw the magnetic intensity dropping, we wouldn't interpret that as a magnetic anomaly, okay? Um, what we do is we set up our. That's why we set up our magnetic base. Okay, so at one spot it can record the time variation of the magnetic field in our area. Right, you can see all these different stations are, are different. Right, all these stations have 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 different, uh, um, um, you know, different signals, different intensities, different changes. Okay, so. Um, um, we will then we can then uh, take our uh, you know we we if we're interested in in magnetic um, uh, data to an accuracy of fifty uh, nanotesla you know if we have we if we had a fifty nanotesla uh, anomaly in our in our survey all right we'd want to take the data from our um, our uh, base station magnetometer and subtract it from the data you know at at the corresponding time. Right from our roving magnetometer, and that'll get rid of the, the diurnal variation. All right, so that's the reason, really, for setting up a. Uh, 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 that's really the whole reason for setting up a magnetic base station. Now you might be able to get some of these little jerks in the magnetic field, but if there's uh, really a lot of solar activity, and uh, I have to, I have to tell you, a giant new sunspot has appeared. Uh, uh, on the uh, it, it appeared uh, last week uh, first on the other side of the sun from Earth, and it let loose a gigantic uh, coronal mass ejection uh, toward Mars. So we'll see what that does to uh, our uh, the instruments we have on Mars right now. Uh, but this sunspot is rotating toward us now, and it's probably going to be uh, uh, playing havoc with uh, with the data that, that you'll take. And so here, you know, this plot from Nat Natural Resources Canada, you know, we want to get that. Uh, we want to record this plot. You know, we'll come back to our uh, our, our rooms at the Yarrington Inn, and we'll get this plot. You know, via their uh, free Wi-Fi, and um, and we'll look at it, and we'll see. Oh, you know, was there a storm here? They they notice this these uh, places at some stations, Yellowknife, and Fort Churchill. Okay, uh, they flag some as yellow. Okay. And that's where the uh, the the magnetic susceptibility changed, you know, in less than a minute by a hundred nanotesla. And sometimes, you know, when solar activity is high, you look at this, and instead of being fifty uh, nanotesla's variation, it'll be five hundred. Or I've even seen it with a thousand nanotesla's variation on some of these stations. Uh, and and most of it will be yellow. Okay. Those are the days when you know the magnetic uh, jerks are happening so fast and so unpredictably that even with even with a magnetic base station that day, um, you know our data are going to be garbage. We just can't use it. Okay, so you know we set out our magnetic base station. That's just to get diurnal variation. It's not going to going to help us with the magnetic storms if they're big enough. Okay, um, and we could get unlucky. You know you, that sunspot could. Could be pointed at us. It could let loose a, uh, a magnetic storm, and if uh, you know the satellites will will see that, and uh, we might even decide, ah, okay, we're not going to do any any magnetics. You know, we'll get warning the night before. We're not going to do any magnetics the day uh, um, the day after because uh, there is just a big coronal mass ejection. It's headed toward Earth, and we're going to see a lot of uh, magnetic uh, storming uh, the next day. Okay. So uh, with this, the app called um, um, uh, let's see, oh, 3D Sun is what it's called. Uh, you can actually get a, a prediction of magnetic storms uh, like 12 hours in advance. Okay, so uh, we'll be monitoring 3D Sun when we come back from the field after we collect our magnetic data. We'll go to this Natural Resources Canada site and uh, we'll we'll take a look at the Victoria Station. 
And if the Victoria station's like this, well, then we'll be aware, OK, we've got to watch out. right? We could have a 100 nanotesla uh, magnetic anomaly that's, that's totally false because it's just diurnal variation. Okay, so we'll have to, you know, we'll have to correct our our rover magnetometer data for the uh, the base station magnetometer, um, and then if we're unlucky enough to see some real storming activity, uh, then we might even uh, have to go uh, go back and recollect the data on a quieter day. Um, you know, I, I I thought our our year of uh, you know heavy sunspot activity was over with uh, last year. Uh, but then that uh, huge new sunspot opened up and uh, been blasting out coronal mass ejections uh, into the uh, magnetic, well, into Mars's uh, uh, atmosphere, and it's gonna it, it has a potential to blast a coronal mass ejection into our uh, magnetosphere, and so that would play havoc with our uh, with our data. Okay, now where do you where do you get this plot from Natural Resources Canada? Uh, let me just take you back. Okay, so here's our field project uh, preparation page, and you go down a bit uh, toward the bottom of the introduction where I have all the you know just link after link after link. So here's the link to Paces. Here's the link to Natural Resources Canada. Okay, and um, and so forth. So that's where you uh, you can link to it. Um, I think they got some pretty um, you know antiquated servers there. It it, it took two tries and. Uh, and uh, you know, 15 minutes for the page to load tonight, so um, that uh, that can be a problem. And uh, I will talk. Uh, so that's a bit about uh, magnetic data collection, and uh, we'll talk more about interpretation in the second uh, in the second lecture.